good afternoon. Uh, so the talk that I had prepared for the last time I was going to give a BBC um, is what I'll do today. And the last BBC was about the knapweed, so I thought that was way more important. Um, but this talk is still pretty alive for me, so I thought I'd share. It's actually a, a two-part talk, and it's about the language that we use to describe the situations that we encounter. So at the Abbey every day, we start our mornings by saying various mantras. And these mantras bless our speech, and they also try and set our minds in a good direction. So the mantras for blessing the speech involve um, taking refuge, generating bodhicitta, and then reciting the Sanskrit alphabet, and then a mantra on the heart of dependent arising that the Buddha uttered soon after his awakening. And at that point, the chant leader often encourages everyone to also be mindful of their inner speech throughout the day and to, I'm sorry, at that point, the leader encourages us to be mindful of our speech throughout the day make sure that it's truthful, timely, wise, and kind. And they do this because our speech is actually a really big part of our practice. Um, we can do a lot of harm with speech that is maybe untrue, unkind, divisive, or just waste people time, waste people's time. And likewise, we can also do a lot of good with our speech when we say things that are encouraging and supportive to people who are struggling or encourage people who are arguing to reconcile or um, are just kind and uplifting to somebody who is um, you know, feeling not so happy at the time. And just as important as our communication with other people is our inner speech. So this is uh, mostly what I'll be talking about today. And our inner speech is how we both describe things going on around us and how we talk to ourselves as a person. And psychology recognizes that how we speak to ourselves can have a really big influence on our mood, um, on our self-esteem, and also how we interpret and respond to the world around us. And so if we are used to speaking to ourselves in harsh or critical ways, uh, we're likely to also feel that way about others when we look at them and try to judge them, and also to be just more anxious and uh, lack confidence ourselves. So we probably all have certain words that we use to say what kind of person we are. And some of these are not so useful, uh, maybe like lazy or angry or forgetful. Um, there's even less harmful words like introvert, extrovert, um, but these words, I think they really limit um, who we are and our ability to respond flexibly in, in different situations. And living at the Abbey, I'm constantly reminded just how unskillful my speech is um, because I have to talk to people all day long. Uh, so that's been a big learning uh, opportunity. Um, so the first word that I think I'd like to uh, talk about um, that really limits my thinking is the word but. And uh, this is but with one T, not two. So uh, of course, and <laughs> with all these words, there's context where it's going to be appropriate. So it's more being mindful of, of the way that we're using these words. But um, <laughs> however, how about however? <laughs> I notice that I tend to use the word but as a limiting factor, that it's an excuse as to why something can't be done. And Venerable Chojin talks about this all the time when she tells her um, unruly disciples some advice, and they say, yes, but, and for ex an example of this is, yes, the root of anger is in my mind, but those people are really insulting and obnoxious, and how could I not respond with anger? And I often also use but to detract from the positiveness of a situation. So for example, someone might say, oh, you gave a really good BBC the other day. I say, yeah, but I forgot to mention a, this really good quote that I wanted to share with everyone. 
And then, but can also limit our options. Like if I said, I really want to go to India on a pilgrimage, but I don't have any money. And if I stopped just there, I wouldn't maybe take steps to acquire the money to go on the trip. And then um, most interestingly, I found that but creates false dichotomies, uh, such as I have Buddha nature, but I'm an ordinary sentient being with afflictions. And at least in my mind, the part that comes after the but is more important than the first part. So being an ordinary being with afflictions kind of cancels out the having Buddha nature part. So I think a better way to say this would be, I have Buddha nature, Buddha nature, and I'm an ordinary sentient being with self-grasping ignorance. And replacing the but with and allows me to see the whole picture and to recognize that there's both positive and negative aspects to any given situation. And I've actually worked on this one the most, switching and for but, and I found that it really calms my mind and it, um, because it reduces the conflict that I perceive in the world. Well, another word for me that has become really suspect is mistake. And I realized this recently when I made a decision and then someone later changed that decision. And then another person used the word to describe what happened as something like a mistake. And then a fourth person said, <laughs> how about we call that learning? And so that really made me think about um, you know, the word mistake and how uh, we actually can't learn anything without making mistakes. And the most important life lessons come from making mistakes. So can anything ever really be a mistake? Um, and why should the mistake have a negative connotation if so many positive things come from it? And we can't know everything in advance and um, we often do the best that we can with the information that we have. And so I think that in instead of using the word mistake, uh, from now on I'm gonna use the term learning opportunity or valuable learning opportunity. And then uh, an ep the next group of words that uh, I'd like to banish um, is the term that I use. Um, I don't know if that's skillful or not. But yeah, the next group of words I'd like to banish are what I call unskillful hypotheticals. And the chief of these is should. So we often use should to talk about our expectations about a situation or goals that we'd like to meet. Um, however, the way that it's uh, comes across as sort of like an authority or an external force that's demanding things to be a certain way. And instead of saying, I want to run a marathon, I should run a marathon, um, I think saying it the first way would get rid of this feeling of uh, some kind of external rule or standard being imposed on us from above and would give us more energy to actually work towards the goal that we want to meet. And we also use the word should to deny the reality of a situation, uh, which never helps and can only lead to unskillful actions. So instead of saying, he should know better than that, or people shouldn't pollute so much, we could say, apparently he doesn't know another way to act, so maybe I can find a way to help him learn. Or the world is polluted, but I can find ways to reduce my own impact and then help others to do the same. So I think this way of talking or thinking, it avoids creating the separations between ourselves and others, especially when we're talking about other people's behavior. So yeah, using, um, getting rid of the word should when talking about other people's behavior, it gets rid of the separation that um, we can create between ourselves and them. And by staying connected, we can then reach out to them and work in constructive ways together. So I found that should can be particularly harmful when applied to self-conceptions, such as, I should be thinner, I should know more by now, I should not have so much anger, or I should know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. So this was a huge um, pitfall for me in my teens and early 20s, and it didn't really help me make any kind of progress or um, constructive steps in the right direction. So instead of saying things like that, we can say, I care about my health, 
So I will try to find ways to exercise more often. Or I really enjoy learning the Dharma because it helps me, me and my mind and others. So I'm going to continue studying and learning. So a, another similar phrase to should is if only, such as if only someone had in, invented firearms, or if only they hadn't run that red light, or if only I had graduated from college. And the implication is we'd all be happier and better off. And again, this is pushing reality away, setting it apart from ourselves as something undesirable. And this keeps us stuck in wishing rather than thinking about ways to put our values and aspirations into practice in the present moment. So there are two other groups of words that I found unskillful, but I will save these for the next BBC. And in the meantime, I encourage everyone to be mindful of their inner speech and outer speech too, and to try and identify words or phrases that limit um, how we're thinking and, and perceiving and try and replace words that cause suffering or doubt with words that increase our ease and joy. <laughs>